All right, let the church say amen. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters and visitors. Thank you for being with us this afternoon as we gather to honor God this Lord's Day. We know that last week we began our study um, on the effects of stinking thinking, right? You you could let that ruminate and resonate for a little while. Enemies of the mind. And so we'll be focusing on how to keep our minds healthy, knowing that the Bible is not meant just for information, but the Bible is given to us for transformation. And so considering verses like Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that encourages us not to conform any longer to the pattern of this world. If you have your Bibles, underline that, highlight that, star it, make sure you have this memorized. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. If you don't know what the pattern of this world is, it's everything opposite of what we read in the scripture. And so we are no longer to to follow the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I see somebody shaking their head, right? Our minds need to be renewed. If you agree with that, say amen. Our minds need to be renewed. And so as we think about renewing our minds, you need to consider that the cleansing agent for a clean mind is the word of God. The more word that goes in, the cleaner our minds will be then we will be able to test and approve what God's good will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We can't understand that if our mind is clouded by the things of this world. But the more word that goes in, the more likely we are to be able to distinguish good from evil. Essentially, that's what 2 Timothy tells us, right? That the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so we need to pour into the scriptures. We are also told in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, what happens when we don't immerse ourselves in the word of God. When we allow ourselves to be consumed by the things of this world. The Bible says here, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. You know, essentially the Bible teaches us here, when we come into a knowledge of the truth, when we come into a knowledge of the word of God, When we understand the things that were taught today, that we not only remember Jesus, but we know that Jesus is coming again, we're going to change our minds. But if you decide not to change your mind, the Bible has a warning for us here in Romans chapter 1. And the warning is that if you do not change your mind, God will give you over to those things that you're not willing to change on your own. And so there's a a good encouragement here to get our minds right. right. We need to get our minds right. We continue thinking about what the enemies of the mind will effectively prevent in your life and my life. Some of us, because we've lived long enough, have experienced these things already. Uh, We will be prevented from renewing our mind. You know that when you got baptized, you got baptized, and prior to that, there should have been some repentance that began. And so as we continue to live our lives in Christ, our mind should be renewed and that should show up in repentance. If you were to see Rob Young 30 years ago, I hope that he would look a lot different than he does now. Because the mind has constantly been renewed up to this point. We should see transformation of the Holy Spirit. Right? Once again, change should be happening over time. And we should be able to discern God's will. But when we give in, uh, give way to the enemies of the mind, we're not able to do that anymore. Some of us know what that's like when you're set with a a decision in front of you and you're like, I don't know what to do. Oftentimes we don't know what to do because we're wrestling, right? We're wrestling with the pattern of this world versus the pattern of God. These things show up in our life. If you want to know if you're giving way to any enemies of the mind, they show up by conformity to the world and its standards. You have to ask yourself right now, what do I base my life on? Am I basing my life on, you know, what I see in social media, what I see in the media, you know, what I hear on? I mean, I don't even know if the show still exists, The Voice, right? I don't think Oprah's still on, right? Like, you know, but those are some of the shows that we might say, hey, what's the newest trend? I'm going to go follow that. I'm going to go do this thing. 
Years and years and years ago, we used to say we're trying to keep up with the Joneses, not Jeffrey and Melissa Jones. But that was just a saying, like, hey, we're trying to keep up with our neighbors. Moral corruption. The inability to distinguish between good and evil. I'll just throw out a very quick thing, right? We're in Christ. We know that we are to submit to the governing authorities, and yet... I'm sure that somebody in the room, when April 15th rolls around, we're like, hmm, do I report this or not? Why is that? Because I have an enemy in my mind, right? Because I'm conforming to the world. Because I know a couple of people who do that same thing. They claim children that they don't have. They do it, so why not me? And then apathy, numbness. We get to the point where, you know what, it doesn't even bother me anymore. I've been doing this same thing over and over and over again. I know that it was wrong. Um, It used to prick my conscience, but now I'm just apathetic. We we don't want this to be the outcome for us in our lives. Today we're going to embark on part one of Enemies of the Mind. Pedro did the introduction last week. We're going to be talking about guilt and shame, right? That's what we're going to be talking about today, guilt and shame. Uh, how many people here have felt guilt before? And how many people here have felt shame, right? And we're going we're gonna to get into those definitions right now. When we talk about guilt, and I'm really thinking about this from a very um, objective view, when we talk about guilt, it's the fact of having committed a breach of conduct, especially violating a law and involving a penalty, right? I've done something wrong. It's very objective. I've done something wrong. God says to um, be gentle and kind, and I just yelled at my kid. Right? That, that would be a violation. I know, I know we think yelling at our children is okay, but no, that's a violation. Right? Biblically speaking, this is the important part that we need to get about guilt. Biblically speaking, it is God's mechanism. That means God has put it in our lives for a purpose. It is God's mechanism to help us know when we've sinned. Think about that, right? We need to know when we've sinned against him or someone else, right? There is a reason when, and I use children, you yelled at our children, but maybe I spoke inappropriately to my wife. There's a reason that after I've done that and I walk away, I I don't feel good, right? There's something that's uh, alarming me, that you've done the wrong thing. And ultimately, when I'm feeling that guilt, I need to repent. I need to go back This is a little marriage one-on-one for you guys. I need to go back, and I need to say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. Can you imagine what would happen if we could do those things and walk away and we don't feel anything at all? But understand that guilt is something, and we're going to get into the scripture shortly, that God has designed to help us. To help us. Now, knowing that guilt is something that God designed to help us, you should know that whatever God designed to help us, Satan wants to turn it into something bad. And so we get to shame, right? And shame is a feeling of embarrassment or humiliation that arises from, and this is the key word here, from the perception of having done something dishonorable, immoral, or improper, right? So it's a perception. We just went from the objective to the subjective. It's not what really is, it's what is going on in my mind at the time. Satan uses this to make a person feel worthless, unlovable, or broken. And you can see right away, this is in direct opposition to what God would want us to feel, right? What God would want us to know about ourselves. And yet we've all wrestled with this. My wife was asking me, have you ever felt shame? And I was like, at first I was like, no, I've never felt that. And then I was like, wait a second. I'm like, when I had to go through some church discipline, you know what? I had to wrestle with that. Why? Because my mind wants to tell me you're no good. You should never come back. You should just keep doing what you're doing. Leave those people alone. They're good people. But the spirit is there too prompting and guiding, right? And what I've noticed is that every time I go through any kind of transition, right, 
who said, oh, yeah, I remember when I got my license to become an assistant principal, and I thought I had a job, and then they said, nope, sorry, somebody else got that job. And I said, okay, some wrestling had to happen there. Because now I'm saying to myself, and I'm putting this in real terms so we could all um, identify, and now I'm wondering, am I good enough? What was better about that person? Why didn't I get the job? Did I say the right thing? You know, you, you know how we go through that. In every stage of life where there's a transition, even going from single to married, I always joke and say when I was a single man, I was the most humble, the most kind, the most encouraging, the most, and then I crossed over to married, and I'm like, man, I think I'm the worst person ever. <laughs> Why? Because that transition left me in, a, in an unstable spot, and now I'm wrestling. I'm wrestling with who God says I am, with what my mind is perceiving, right? Because this woman that I married is like, you didn't do this right, you didn't get that right, the garbage is still waiting. She didn't really say that, she didn't really say that. But you see, it causes you to wrestle. And if we're not wrestling with the things of God, we can easily lose that that battle, right? And take us into a, a, a bad place. This is what the Bible says about guilt, right? Just so you know that it is coming from the word of God. This is the passage in Romans chapter 3 where God basically says in verse 9, there are none righteous. No, not even one. There are none righteous. When it comes to guilt, we all are guilty, as we're going to see very shortly. Because no one is righteous, no one does the right thing, everyone curses, their mouths are full of of cursing, Um, the, the um, the viper of snakes are on their lips. That's what the Bible says here. And he he says in verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God, right? And you can see God has a purpose for guilt. His purpose is to show us where we stand before him. He says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law... It is the knowledge of sin. And so we have this going on. We need to know when we are doing the wrong thing in God's sight. And the objective term here is in God's sight. Very important. A lot of times the reason why we float over to the shame part is because we are working with somebody else's perception of us. Now, I'm going to say this, I'm not saying this is true of every parent in the room, but it's very likely that your child is struggling with identity and um, they're struggling with worthiness because of what you say to them, right? We don't, we don't understand that per se because we didn't necessarily grow up in a generation where we took those things so, so weighty and heavy, but when you say certain things to your children, man, it hits them like a ton of bricks, And they may not say it to you out loud, but they are thinking now that their life is based on your perception and not on God's. And so we want to be careful of that. Because this story doesn't end with just God showing that the world is guilty of sin. He goes on in verse 21 through 24. He says, now, right, for those who are in Christ, now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is the important part, right? We read all of that and we can walk away and be like, man, what was me, right? But it continues. He says here, being justified freely. By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means that although I am guilty, Jesus has taken away all my sins. He says that it is through his grace. Now, grace is important. It would have been interesting if he said by his mercy. He doesn't say by his mercy. He says by his grace. Mercy says, I don't get what I deserve. Grace says, I'm giving you something you don't deserve. And what is God giving us? He says, I'm giving you a clean slate. Not only am I giving you a clean slate, as we get through this lesson, you'll see that I'm also making you better than you've ever been before. The Bible says here, it is grace through the redemption. 
that means maybe, maybe, not in all cases, but maybe you were thinking you weren't worth the death of Christ. Maybe you were thinking you weren't good enough. Maybe you were thinking you were unlovable. Maybe you grew up with having, without having a physical father in the home. What does the Bible tell us? Is that God, through Jesus Christ, has changed all of it. If you didn't have a father, you have a father now. If you didn't have a family, you have a family now. If you were unloved before, guess what? God said, I so loved you enough to let my son die for you. He's changed everything about who we are and how we should be living this life. That guilt that God wanted us to be aware of, he says, I want you to be aware of it, not only for your sin, but because I'm going to take it away. If you're willing to do what I ask you to do, all right? Repent and be baptized. We'll talk more about that later. What does this show up? How does this show up? How do I do this, right? How do I move from guilt, um, from shame to guilt and let it work in my life in the right way? Well, we have a passage of scripture that many of us are familiar with. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, this is really the idea of how to use guilt to our advantage and not let shame take over. We see it says here in verse 10, for godly sorrow, godly guilt, allowing the mechanism that God has given us to work the way it's supposed to work and do what it's supposed to do, produces repentance leading to salvation. Now, I'll tell you, I know that those of us in the room, sometimes we do the wrong thing, we say the wrong thing, we act the wrong way, and we get that prick in our heart, that conviction, that guilt. And what do we do with it? It would be easy for me to walk away and keep on walking. And sometimes what the world has taught us to do is bury that feeling. Bury it. Tuck it away. You know what? That person who you just gave the business to, they deserved it. But that's not what God says. What God says is that if we have godly sorrow, that's not just in the church, brothers and sisters. It's not just with the brothers and sisters. It's not just with the husbands and wives. It's not just with the parents and the children. It's with the bosses. It's with the gas attendant. It's with the um, clerk at the supermarket. There are times where in my workspace, I have given somebody the business. This is a long time ago. And guess what I had to do? I knew right away. I'm like, I got to go apologize. And when I went with the godly sorrow and, and repented to this person and we made amends, I think for the rest of that day, we were both apologetic to each other, so much so that the whole office was like, can you guys please stop? <laughs> it's over already. But the fact is, is that godly sorrow should produce repentance. It shouldn't walk away with me just feeling bad. It should make me do something. And it should lead to salvation, not to be regretted. Think about that. Not to be regretted. What does that mean? That means that act that I, I did wrong, once I've repented of it, usually I'm able to let it go. In fact, the person that I did it to, they might let it go too because it's over, it's done, we're moving forward. But if I don't do that, I give Satan and, and the dark kingdom an opportunity to remind me again and again and again and again. He says, but the sorrow of the world, shame, right? The sorrow of the world produces death. Let that resonate a little bit. I know that repenting, saying sorry, seeking forgiveness is not an easy thing. But it produces life. And in fact, if you think about hard things, as I think about all the moms in the room, I know childbearing wasn't easy, right? But what did it produce? Right? Beautiful children. The hard things produce really good things. It's the easy stuff that you should be concerned about. Worldly sorrow produces death. It says, for observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. This is what should happen, right? Godly sorrow, godly guilt should produce diligence in me. What clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. 
when I find out that, oh man, I've done the wrong thing, like I want to run to make it right. Why? Because that's what God would want me to do. It's not time for me to um, dig in my heels and be like, I don't care. I'm not going to talk to that person. In fact, I'm never talking to them again. Those grudges, I mean, some of your families, you know. You have, you have biological family members who will say, I'm never going to talk to my sister ever again. That sounds crazy, right? So can you imagine if the people of God act that same way? And say, oh, I'm never going to talk. or I'm not going to. No, that can't happen. We need to have indignation. We need to have fear. We need to have vehement desire. We need to have zeal. It says, in all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. That's what needs to happen. This is a biblical reference to godly guilt versus worldly sorrow, shame. And right now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at two examples, two character examples in the Bible, and we're going to see shame versus guilt, what it looks like in real time from a biblical perspective. We have two characters. I think they are good examples of shame versus guilt and how, what, and how we end up when we don't do what we need to do. So let's take a look at Judas Iscariot. All right, hopefully we're familiar with this character. And what we want to see is when shame takes over your mind, we're going to see what happens here. We're looking first at Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 to 16. Um, the Bible says here that one of the 12, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him, that is Jesus Christ, to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought an opportunity to betray him. And so it's very clear here, right, even the language that's being used, betray, right, that what Judas is doing is not right. It's not right from a biblical account. You should not betray anyone. But that's exactly what he's doing. And so, let's see. So we already established he's going to be guilty of doing something wrong. Let's see how it continues to play out. Here in Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5, it says, Then Judas, his betrayer, that is Jesus, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, now he's looking at Jesus, they have already arrested him, they're leading him um, to the chief priest, and eventually um, to crucifixion. He says, Seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Does Judas know that he did the wrong thing? Yes. How do we know Judas knows? Because Judas says, I've, I've done the wrong thing. His conscience and God are convicting him of sin. That's what's supposed to happen. The question that we need to ask now is, what is Judas going to do with that? And it says, and they said, what is it to us? You see to it. Now that phrase, you see to it, that is um, the chief priest's way of saying, hey, it's not on us, it's on you. Right? This man that's being condemned, he's on you, that blood, his blood is on your head. Right? So now Judas is taking on the perception that the chief priests have given him. And now the shame is going to begin to set in. And it says that then he threw down the 30 pe the pieces of silver in the temple, departed, and he had death by suicide. Now, you tell me what the 2 Corinthians chapter 10 say. Did it not say that worldly sorrow produces what? Death, right? That shame. What was... Um, Judas thinking about. He was not considering or thinking that, you know what, maybe Jesus will give me a second chance. He was not thinking that. In fact, what did he not do? And this is where we all need to pay attention and make sure that we are not doing these things. First and foremost, Judas did not turn to God. He did not go from the chief priest and say, God, help me. God, I've sinned. God, I've done the wrong thing. He did not do that. He did not seek reconciliation. He did not say, you know what, I need to find Jesus right away and let Jesus know I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I betrayed you. He did not do that either. 
He did not seek out the other apostles. He didn't say, you know what, let me catch up with my other brothers and find out, let them know that I've done the wrong thing. Maybe they'll pray for me. Maybe they'll give me some advice of what I should do. He did not do that. What he did was he isolated himself and then he took matters into his own hands. Now you think about it like I'm thinking about it and you say, have I ever done that before? And if I've done that before, did it put me in a good place or did it put me in a bad place? Right? This is a very sad example of shame and how it is an enemy of the mind. Right? Very, very sad. Now on the other side of this coin, that's the shame part. On the other side of this coin, how do we handle guilt the right way? Well, we'll turn to our apostle Peter. And we'll look at what he, his story tells us about how to handle it the right way. We'll pick up here in John chapter 13, verses 37 and 38. This is where Peter is trying to convince Jesus that, hey, I'm going to die with you, Jesus. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll lay down my life with you. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. I, I want you to put yourself in Peter's shoes right now. I want you to think about what it would be like standing toe-to-toe with Jesus, and you're saying to Jesus, hey, I, I could do this with you. I can go with you. You're going to lay down your life? I'll lay down my life with you. Right? Can you imagine Peter's zeal and his excitement? Like, Lord, if you're going to die, I'm going to die too. Right? Jesus answers him. He says, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. I want you to to envision this for a second. Imagine you were reading the Bible and it was talking about something bad that was going to happen. And it said, Gerard Tui will do this bad thing. What would you do with the Bible if you saw your, like your name? Like, I don't know, your full name, your first, your middle. Your, would you be scared? I, I know I would be scared. If I saw in there, Robert Young will do this bad thing, I'd be like, who wrote this? Like, where did this come from? But I want you to put yourself in Peter's shoes. Right? So Peter is being told this by Jesus himself that, look, even though you think you're tough, big and tough, you're going to deny me three times. You're not going to deny me one time. You're not going to deny me two times. You're going to deny me three times. And it'll be before the rooster even crows. Can you imagine if, if God told you that? Let's see what happens here. So Jesus has been arrested. Jesus is in the, with the chief priests, and they're questioning him. And Peter has been following along, right? He's following along. Um, it says here, having arrested him, they led him, that is Jesus, brought him, that is Jesus, into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. So I want you to keep that in mind. Of course, there's some, there's some uh, weakness here in Peter. He's certainly feeling vulnerable, but he still wants to follow along. It says, now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. This is just a random group of people. And a certain servant girl. Now, it's interesting that they said a girl, right? I don't know if you're making that connection. But, you know, Peter was just with the sword cutting off the chief priest's servant's ear. And now a servant girl is questioning him. Let's see how he responds. It says, seeing him at, as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. What does Peter do? It says, Peter denied Jesus. He denied him. Saying, woman, I do not know him. Now, I want you to think about this. Where was Jesus for three years? He was fulfilling his ministry. Who was with him for three years? Who was on the mount uh, when he transfigured? Who was with him when he was praying his heart out, saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done? Was Peter not there? And now Peter, the same Peter who said, Lord, I will give my life for you. I will die with you. Peter is now saying, I don't don't even know who he is. I don't know him. What did you say his name? Jesus? No, No, I never heard of him. 
It says, and after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. What did Peter say? He says, man, I am not. I am not. Them? I don't even know who them is. I'm not a part of it. So then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. Now, in other uh, verses in the scripture, it says that Peter cursed. Now, I want you to also know that Peter was the one in earshot of Jesus when he said, if you deny me in the front of men, I will deny you in front of my father. I want you to put it in all full context here, right? This is serious business. And Peter, he, he's not only is he guilty once, he's guilty twice, he's guilty three times. It says, immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord, t- I mean, whoa, the rooster crowed, the Lord looks at you like I told you. Man, I, I want to stop right now and just like be quiet for a second and reflect on that. Because that's just a powerful scene right now. It says, then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And then Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Why is Peter whip, weeping? Because he's guilty. He's guilty. Why is he guilty? Because it wasn't someone who said this. It was the Lord himself who told him, you will deny me three times. And that's exactly what happened. And Peter is convicted at the heart. He's guilty. And so this Peter who denied Jesus three times, who was talking all big. I mean, you would think that he's like going to go find himself a quiet place by himself and just be alone. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to tell anybody anything. But that's not what Peter does. Peter finds himself with the other apostles. And it says here in John chapter 20, verse 3 and 4, Peter, um, and then Mary Magdalene comes and tells them like, hey, you know, the, the tomb is empty. And it says Peter went out and the other disciple, that's John, and they were going to the tomb. And it says, so they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. So other than the fact that Peter's a little slow at it, right? The fact is, he was still excited about this whole Jesus, what's going on with Jesus? He did not distance himself. He did not bury himself. He did not isolate himself. He's still thinking about Christ. Despite the fact that he had denied him three times. He was guilty once, twice, three times. Despite the fact that he had violated the very encouragement that Jesus had given him. He's still eager to be a part of this Jesus movement. And so when Jesus finally comes to, to Peter, um, I want you to, I want you to read, read this, take it in deeply, understand what we've just talked about, right? We just talked about the fact that Jesus told Peter a while ago, if you deny me in, in the presence of man, I will deny you in the presence of my father. Peter says, Jesus, we, if you're going to die, I'm going to die. Jesus says, no, you're going to deny me three times. Peter denies him three times using words that we don't even know what he used, right? But he denies him three times. Look at what Jesus says here in his final communication with Peter um, and, and John. He says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. He just told him, hey, the way you came into the world is not the way you're going to go out. And he says, then he said, follow me. I want you to understand what has happened here. Peter, who was guilty, did not handle himself with shame. He handled himself like a child of God. He did not walk away and find isolation. What he did is... He took ownership. He took ownership. We need to own when we make a mistake. Hey, got to own that. I cannot say the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is because you did what you did. Right? No, I can't do that. When the Holy Spirit convicts me of sin, I need to say, yes, I'm guilty. 
right? There's even times where the Holy Spirit will convict me of sin that I'm not aware of, right? Maybe you come and you say, Rob, you know what? When you did this, and I say, wow, sorry. I didn't realize I did that, right? He took ownership and he wept over his sin, right? Why did he weep? Peter wept because he realized who he was offending. He wasn't just offending a man. He wasn't just offending um, some advocate for, you know, spiritual change. He sinned against the Son of God. And I believe that Peter knew that. Peter understood that. And so he did not cry. He did not shed a tear. The Bible says he wept bitterly. Right? To me, that says the snot, the tears, like he, he can't control it. Why? Because he realizes I have just sinned against the Son of God. What I know to be true from what we previously read, he found the other apostles. And I could only imagine that when he came together with his brothers and the women that were also with them, that there was some prayer and there was some advice given. There might have been even someone who said to him, you know what, Peter, I think Jesus can forgive you. Knowing what I know, knowing that Jesus ate with tax collectors, he ate with prostitutes, he ate ate with all these people, knowing that Jesus said, hey, my father's desire is for all men to be saved, knowing that Jesus prayed that I might not lose any of them, I think he'd be willing to forgive you. And most importantly, he kept his eyes on Jesus. He never left. Even, even when he was walking, you know, he was at a distance. He was thinking about Jesus. When they said the tomb was empty, he was like, I'm going to run. Hey, right? I'm going to run to that tomb. Peter's eyes were fixed on Christ. And I just want to point out here that when we follow the pattern of, of repentance, I want you to see the life that this brings. Peter, who denied Jesus three times after Jesus told him face to face that you're going to do this to me. The Bible says here, God says through Christ, you will glorify God. His life is going to be a glory to God. Why? Because he was willing to repent. He was willing to change. He was willing to give God the glory. And so what does Jesus say to the person who's willing to repent, who's willing to acknowledge their sin, who's willing to do something different? Follow me. That's what Jesus says here to Peter. Because of his response to sin, God was able to use him for great things. Right? We know that when we read the book of Acts, who, who's there? Peter. Right? Basically Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul. And so when you think about your life and you want to know about how to use your life for good things— It starts with repentance. Don't allow that guilt to move into shame, but use it and do the right thing with it so that you can be a glory to God. And so really quickly, we're just going to cover four things on how we can overcome shame because we know that it's prevalent in our world, right? We know that it's prevalent. First thing we need to do is we need to seek the Lord. We need to seek the Lord, right? The Bible says here in Psalms 34, Verses 4 through 8, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. We need to seek the Lord, right? Not not look for the Lord, right? Like I'm looking for, no, I need to seek. That means I'm actively doing something to find God. We We used to have this phrase years ago. I think maybe someone wrote a book. It was like chasing God, right? And, it's in, and that's the idea is that I'm always trying to, to, to catch God, right? Now, we know that he's always here with us. But the idea is that I'm doing something because I want to be immersed in God. I need to seek the Lord. And he will deliver me from all, not some, but all my fears. That's what the Bible says. Number two, I need to believe what I read in the scriptures. I need to believe what I read in the scriptures. The Bible says here in Romans 10, 11, whoever believes on him, that is Jesus Christ, will not be put to shame. If I believe on him, if I believe what he said, if I believe that he's the first fruits and I'm going to be following his path, I don't need to be ashamed. I don't need to have any shame. Right? God is telling me that I am worth more than anyone can count. I'm worth more than it. 
Psalm 139, 14, I know some of you in the room know this verse because I, I try to encourage you with this verse. I believe that everybody every morning should wake up in the morning and say, I am wonderful. Why can I say that? Because God told me that. The Bible says here that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I could also say that I'm marvelous because I'm a work of God and it says marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Now imagine if you start your day that way, right? Instead of worrying about what your hair looks like, you say, you know what? I am wonderful. And because God told me, right? God told me that. No man told me that. No woman told me that. No, no, God told me that. And I am marvelous, right? This is what we should be reminding ourselves of, to get out of shame. Because shame is telling you something completely different, right? Satan's got his mechanisms going to, to promote a whole different narrative. But the narrative that God wants you to have is that you're wonderful, you're marvelous, if you can, write that on your mirror at, at home and just recite that to yourself. I am. You know, your day is going to be a great day when you know you're wonderful. It's going to be a great day. Third thing, confess your sins. Confess, 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 confess your sins. The reality is that Satan wants us to be isolated. He wants you to believe that you are the only one that did this thing and what kind of Christian are you? Anybody ever heard that before? I know I've heard that before. And so what is that? And, and when I say I heard that, I didn't hear it outside. I heard that here. Right? I heard it in my, in my own head. And so what do I need to know? Is that when I put my sins out there, I can tell you, man, when you put your sins out there, usually the people you're talking to are going to be like, yep, I did that too. And you're like, what? You did it too? Like, yeah. And this is what I did to get over it to move on, to repent, to do something different. And it's like, whoa, you mean I'm not alone? No, you're not alone. You're not alone. The Bible clearly teaches us that, you know, we, we are all, all sin is common to men. All sin is common to men. And yet our minds constantly are trying to shame us to believe you're the only one. I can't believe you did that thing, right? If you want to really stretch and grow, what you need to do is you need to be transparent. Transparency takes this confession to a whole nother level because you know what? I'm not hiding anything. I'm putting everything out there. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm confident that the Lord is going to bless me. He's going to bless that transparency. Now, caveat, um, disclaimer, you know, be wise, right? I'm not just saying to go out there and what do we say, verbal diarrhea. No, that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm suggesting. Yes, if you got a negative uh, picture in your head, that's exactly right. Don't go do that. Don't go just dump everything on somebody, but be wise about it, right? You know, find an older brother, find an older sister. Um, find, you really find a circle of trust that you can say, hey, you know, I need to share some things. I can tell you without a doubt, the only reason why I'm standing here right now is because of transparency. There were some things in my life years ago that if I just kept it to myself, I would have been eaten from the inside out. But I, for some reason, I was like, I want to be transparent. I want to just share with my mentor, this is what's going on. This is what I'm doing. And even though it came with consequence, that consequence led to repentance that leaves no regrets and promotes life, right? We need to confess. It says here, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. When I confess, I'm clean, from all unrighteousness. Now, if, you, if you're like me, holding on to sin is like a, a monkey on your back. When you confess that sin, it's gone. I, I don't know about you. That's how it works for me. I confess that sin, and now it's gone. It's like I've been cleansed, like the Bible says here, from all unrighteousness. Now I can, I'm ready to keep going. I am ready to keep going. And then the fourth thing here is we need to live in and for the Lord. I think too many of us in 2024, we are busy, worried about ourselves, right? Maybe it's the iPhone. I don't know. But there's a lot of I and there's a lot of me. And when, you, when it's I and me, that is the ripe environment for enemies of the mind. Because I'm focused too much on myself. What I need to be focused on is the bigger picture. He says, and now little children abide in him that when he appears, 
we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practice righteousness is born of him. Practice righteousness. We need to live in and for the Lord. We need to look at our schedules, 168 hours in the week, and you need to answer this question, how many of those hours are dedicated to the Lord? 168 is a lot of time. How many of those hours are dedicated to the Lord? Because I know, and I share this with my own children, when I'm dedicating my time and energy to the Lord, I feel great. Even when I'm tired, even when I'm exhausted, I feel great. Why? Because I'm practicing righteousness. But when I'm just focused on myself and doing what I want to do, and you ever start to relax a little too much, and you don't feel good anymore. But when you're doing the work of the Lord, man, it's like you're on a high. That's probably why the Bible says don't be drunk on wine, right? But be drunk on the Holy Spirit. Do the things of God. Do the things of God. This is how Paul sums it up. Right? Paul sums it up. He sums up the Christian walk. He says, I am convinced that nothing, nothing, nada, zilch, right? Nothing can ever separate us from God's love with which Christ Jesus our Lord shows us. Right? Along with saying that you're wonderful, along with saying you're marvelous, you need to also be re- reminded that whatever's going on in your head is just there and it cannot. It cannot separate you from the love of God. What that person next to you says about you cannot separate you from the love of God. What you got on your final exam, I know finals just passed, what you got on your finals exam, that cannot separate you from the love of God. We need to be reminded that there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And that we can stand on. That when we feel like we're unlovable, when we feel like we're broken, when we feel unworthy, we can remind ourselves of that, that there is nothing that can separate me from God's love. And because of God's love, I'm going to heaven when I die. I can be confident of that. And so I'll give you one more example here of how guilt should be working in our lives, right? Here in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 38, it says... All, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Right? What does it mean to be cut to the heart? They, they were guilty. Right? They were convicted. They were convinced that what Peter was saying was, was true. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, removal, cleansing of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here's another great example of how hopefully most of us in this room, we started our journey by feeling the conviction, the guilt, that you know what? We are standing outside of Christ, and I need to stand inside Christ. And the way I get inside Christ, I need to repent I need to change the way I think, right? Now think about this. If you were thinking in a, in a shameful way prior to becoming a Christian, then we need to be working to get those thoughts out of there, right? I need to get rid of that because I need to change the way I think and act, and I need to be baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. So in this group of people that were out there hearing this message, some people responded the right way. Their consciences working with the Holy Spirit Move them to repentance and to follow God. It says, and many with, um, with many other words, Peter testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to their number. If you're visiting with us today, if you're struggling with shame, Uh, and you're trying to figure out how do I get into the complete love of God, well, the answer is right here. The Bible tells us that in order to move from a corrupt generation, the pattern of the world, into a better place, I need to repent and I need to be baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. I need to put Christ on in baptism. And when I do that, my whole world will be 
changed. My sins will be cleansed. My mind, most importantly, will be cleansed. I can begin to be a better person because I'm not doing it on my own anymore. God is doing it in me. This is what the Bible teaches us. And so if you're wondering what I must do to be precious in the eyes of God, I want to be precious in the eyes of God. Well, I need to believe, I need to confess, I need to change, repent, and I need to be immersed, that is baptized. And then I need to live faithfully until death. I know that there are some in the room who've been coming, who've been hearing this message over and over and over again. And God has been patient. Because we're still here. We, we woke up this morning. We have breath in our lungs. We have blood in our veins. But who knows what's going to happen in the next moment? Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Right? And so what are you waiting for? The Bible clearly teaches us that today is the day of salvation. And so why would you wait another day, another moment, another hour when you could do it today? Today could be that day. If you're with us and you've been struggling with shame in your life, Come forward and pray. Let us pray for you. Confess your sins. If you, if, you, if you have a guilty conscience, confess your sins. Allow the elders who will be here to pray with you to help guide you and point you in the right direction as we help you fix your eyes on Jesus. The goal for us here is that we all get to heaven. That's the goal. And in order to get to heaven, we got to take whatever enemies are in our mind and we need to let Jesus deal with them by remembering to put the Bible in us, to, to live right with God, to confess our sins, and to make sure that we are living in and for Jesus Christ. Very shortly, oh, I have a video here. All right. And so I encourage you, if you are that person who've been waiting, who's been thinking about, who's been contemplating, who's been wondering, when am I going to do this? Today is the day, right? Let's, let's do it. We, we can make that happen today, immediately following services. You can get in the water. And then you can start your transformation because, you know, what we're sharing with you is not information. It's about transformation. We want you to be different going forward. And like I said, if you're here and you want to pray, you can certainly come forward as we now stand and sing the song of invitation. Good afternoon, church. It is that time in our service in which we give thanks for what the Lord did for us on the cross. Amen. Now today, before we get into the Lord's Supper, there's two key scriptures that I'm going to be highlighting today. One of which we have heard multiple times, which is 1 Corinthians 11:26. And Revelations 19, 6 and 9. Now, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, it states, Paul instructs, For as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What this tells me is, is that every time we engage in the Lord's Supper, we are having that hope for what is to come, and we're one less Lord's Supper before we actually meet him. The verse is, a pivot, is, is very pivotal because it has a duality when you really think about it. On one aspect, it's a remembrance. We're remembering what the Lord did for us on the cross. But also, too, it's an anticipation of what is to come in the future. Each time we partake the bread and the cup, we're not only remembering Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we're actively proclaiming him until we meet him again. It is a bold statement of our faith in Christ. Each and every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are actively telling the world and we are actively showing that our faith is strong and it is being solidified each and every week. Something that we should always keep at the forefront of our minds. And as we do this, it also reminds us that when we actually engage in the Lord's Supper, it is a reminder to spread the good news of Jesus Christ until he returns. In addition to that, as we are remembering, what are we really anticipating as we're engaging in the Lord's Supper? Revelations 19, 6 and 9 reminds us, right? We encounter a vivid portrayal of a heavenly celebration known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Here, the Apostle John describes a scene of great rejoicing. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, 
like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord of God, the Almighty, reigns. This passage in and of itself invites us to look forward, to leap forward with our thoughts, and to focus on things above, ultimately fulfilling God's promise. The marriage supper of the Lord symbolizes the intimate and joyous union between Christ and his church, marking the culmination of waiting and the beginning of eternity with our Lord. It, in and of itself, is a celebration of victory, a feast of thanksgiving, and a profound union with Christ. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper and we're thinking of the future and we're thinking above, we should keep that in mind. So the question comes into mind, how do we really live with such remembrance on one hand and then on the other hand with such expectation? First, by continually remembering and proclaiming Christ's death and resurrection through the participation in the Lord's Supper, first and foremost. Each observance is an, a reaffirmation of the faith and a renewal of our commitment of Christ. Secondly, we are called to live in joyful participation of the marriage supper. Let us think of what is to, to come. Let us think of what we are to anticipate and what the Lord will be blessing us with. As we come towards the end of this and we actually come to the culmination before we actually take the Lord's Supper today, I want us to really stop and think. And let us remember the sacrifice of the Lord. Let us not forget that. Let us remember the promise that was made as we're thinking forward of our future, right? And let us never, ever forget the things that were taught to us as we solidify our faith more and more as we engage in the act of the Lord's Supper. Let this, may this act of, of communion strengthen our faith continuously each week as we do this. Let it enrich our fellowship on a continuous basis, right, as a church, and renew our hope as we wait for eternity to spend that with the Lord. Amen.